The Campus Church at Pensacola Christian College invites you to rejoice in the Lord. preach a message this morning concerning the power and the preaching of Jesus Christ. Dr. Atkins began reading there in verse 16. We need to look at verse 15 just for a moment to understand where, we're, where we are. Jesus has just fed 5,000 men, possibly 15,000 people with five little loaves and a couple of fish. And do you remember, as we were looking at verse 15, Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king. He departed again into a mountain himself alone. He left and then he he sent his disciples away. Verse 16 says he went, he sent them down to the coast and they found a little boat and they went over across the sea. But please understand, it's not a long trip from Bethsaida where they were to Capernaum. It's about five miles And the word of God tells me that they had rowed about three of those five miles. It tells us many things about that trip. One, there was a storm. Two, it was dark. And three, that phrase, and Jesus was not come to them. All those things are so true in the hearts of men. Look at the power of of darkness. We're talking about Jesus Christ and his power over darkness. It was dark. And he was not there. And there was a storm. But he's going to do something wonderful in the midst of all this. His power over darkness is amazing. First John tells us this God is light. In him is no darkness at all. What is darkness? Darkness in our life spiritually is nothing more than the absence of Jesus Christ. Because he is light. In him there is no darkness at all. All people are in darkness without Jesus. Sometimes I think we forget that. That darkness is a terrible place to be. Terrors and problems in life are real enough in and of themselves. But you add darkness... And you add the absence of Jesus Christ, and they assume extremes of fear and apprehension. So many today live their life without God and without Christ in this world. Imagine living your whole life and never having heard of Christ. Never having been confronted with his promises. Never having heard those blessed sweet words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Where would your life be had you never heard those words? What if you never heard Romans 10? And if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We really, without thinking about it, without being conscious of it, without making it an act of our will, we take for granted how good God has been in our life. To tell us of his love, to show us that he cared, to shine his light in our heart. And we forget how fortunate we are. Millions are born in the darkness, duped by false religion, deprived of the scriptures, and a stranger to the grace of God. Romans 10 says, How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Preacher there doesn't mean someone who by their vocation stands behind a pulpit. It means a herald, just someone who would tell them the truth. And how shall they hear? 
without a herald. Would, would you keep your place here in John and, and look at Matthew chapter 5 with me for a moment. Jesus, of course, is preaching and he talks to us about being the salt in verse 13. In verse 14, it says this, ye are the light of the world. Now, Jesus is the light come from God, but Jesus went back to be with his father and he has now left us to share the light that he shared. And he says that to his followers. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, we don't, we don't intentionally put a bushel on our light. I don't think any of us get up in the morning and decide in our heart, today I'm going to make sure I don't tell anybody how good Jesus is. Today I'm just going to make it a point to never mention his name to anybody that crosses my path. I don't think any of us actually come to that place. But if we're not sharing the light and no one sees the light, you might as well put a bushel basket over it and hide the light. This world is, is exactly where they were. They're in the dark, they're in a storm, and Jesus was not come to them. And it's up to us to be a light. It's up to us to make sure they see him, they hear his name, they hear his promises, they are aware of his love. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The first chapter of John says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness. And Jesus told his disciples before he left, ye are the light of the world. You shine where I would have. It's up to us to share his name. I don't know. If you remember when you did not know Christ or not, but I can't think of any words more weighty, more filled with sorrow and more filled with despair than the words in Jesus was not come to them. To be without Christ is a fearful thing, but Christ has power over darkness and he will shine in the darkness. Notice he also has power over fear. Look at verse 18. Sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. When they had rowed, I want you to notice rowed. We think of them in a sailboat. They are in a smaller boat. They are rowing. I, I picture a little, little bitty thing with maybe, maybe two different sets of oars and they're taking turns rowing and it's hard against the current and against the wind. This is the small little ship they're in. It, it is not a big sailboat, not a big fishing boat, something very small. And they're rowing. Great wind blew. So when they had rowed about five and 20 or 30 furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nine of the ship and they were afraid. But he said unto them, it is I. Be not afraid. A tempest overtook these men. Storm came without warning. They often do on the Sea of Galilee. The high mountains on either side and the winds can come through like a, like a tunnel. And it doesn't take much to whip up some pretty good sized waves and put this little ship in great jeopardy. And it overtook them and they were very much afraid. I don't know if they were as much afraid of the, of the wind and the waves as they were of what they saw. What makes you afraid? Do you know Christ as your Savior? If you don't, there's much, there's much to fear in your life. There, there's much that would cause you consternation and, and fear and trepidation in your heart and mind. Think about all the things that come across us because we just happen to be humans. Storms bring damage to us, ruin, wreckage, and Broken homes and broken hearts, disease, despair, death, loss. There's much in our life to cause fear. Terror overwhelmed these men, but not necessarily the storm, not necessarily the natural phenomena of the waves and the wind, but there was a terrifying sight coming toward them. The wind is blowing. Jesus is wearing a typical garment of the day and it would have been blown in the wind every which direction and would have given him really no particular shape. 
His hair is blowing back into the wind. And there are waves. Can you picture this? As Jesus walks toward them and he's on the crest of the wave. And in just a moment, he's in the trough and he disappears. And he comes back to the crest again. And he's back down the trough again. And they're looking over there and they're thinking, what are we seeing? And it's coming right at them. And they see it and they don't see it. And see it and they don't see it. And every time they see it, it's closer than it was the last time they saw it. And they're, 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 they're frightened by it. And Jesus knew they were afraid. Are you afraid? What is it that causes your heart? Fear. Above the scream of the wind came a very sweet, calming voice. It is I. Be not afraid. He comes to you as the kind shepherd. He comes to you as the compassionate Samaritan. They're in the dark. They're without him and they're afraid. And Jesus comes to them as only Jesus can. He comes to comfort them. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, the thought of coming to Christ might frighten you. It may give you some fear. You may think, well, I don't know. I don't know anything about this. I, I, don't, I know I need something. I don't know that much about Jesus. And there could be some fear in your heart about coming to him. And you need to understand, he comes to you like he came to them. It is I. Be not afraid. He comes to you as a good shepherd. He already has the 90 and 9. He's looking for the one. He comes to you as the good Samaritan, beat up and left in a ditch, your life in a mess, other people passing you by and not caring about you, but he comes to pour oil in the wound and he comes to bind your wounds and he comes to heal and he comes to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. It is I, he said, don't be afraid. He saw them. His thoughts were with them. Where was he? He had gone to a mountain alone to pray. And while there, he is aware of what's going on with them, and he leaves that place of prayer, and he goes straight to them. He saw the predicament they were in. He heard their voices cry for help before they ever knew he was anywhere near them. He could have prevented that storm, but he chose not to. The storm was in his will. He's going to use that storm as a means to an end. He's going to use it to strengthen their faith, draw them closer to him, and help them realize the power that he has over fear. He has power over darkness, for he is indeed the light. He has power over fear, for he is the only one they can do for you. And calm your heart. Nothing else will ever do it. Verse 21, look what they did. They willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. They received him into the ship. I'm sure they grabbed him and pulled him into the ship. We need you right now. Come and help us. And I love that word, they received him into the ship. And that's what you need to do. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you need to receive him. You need to bring him where you are. He wants to be there. He speaks to you. He tells you not to be afraid. He, he tells you why he's there. He wants you to know that, that he loves you dearly. And you need to just accept and receive the help that Jesus desperately wants to give you if you do not know him. They received him. Have you ever received him? Receiving him is the only way to calm the storms in your life. And there is a tremendous statement made in verse 21. And immediately, immediately the ship was at the land whether they went. They were two miles out of Capernaum. But when Jesus got in the ship, immediately the ship was where the ship was going. It was in safe harbor. It was out of the wind and out of the rain and out of the waves. And it was in a safe place. Do you understand the power of Jesus Christ? If you understood his power, you'd know that there was nothing in you he cannot fix. Nothing about you he cannot solve. If you knew his power, he expresses here complete and absolute authority over the laws of physics. 
Time and distance mean nothing to him. And, and it is a glorious picture of our wonderful life to come on the other side when time and distance won't matter at all. They're there, and immediately they're someplace else. Nothing is recorded about what they said about that, but I'm sure there was quite a bit said about it. That's not something that happens every day. He can abolish the pain in your heart just like he abolished time. He can abolish the confusion and the hopelessness you feel just like he abolished distance. It is nothing to him. Are you in the dark? He's the light. Are you in a storm? He's the resolution. And you need to come to him and receive him. See the power of Christ. Hear the preaching of Christ. Would you look at verse 22? The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save that one whereunto his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. Look at verse 24. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? They're astonished. They, they've got this figured out. They, they saw the disciples get in the boat and go. And Jesus wasn't with them. And the next morning, they're looking for Jesus. They know he went up into a mountain to pray. Surely he'll come down. And they realize he's not there. There's no one to come down. So they go to Capernaum. And when they get to Capernaum, they find Jesus there. They said, well, when, when did you get here? How did you get here? I, I can hear the questions now. We saw your disciples get in the boat and leave. We saw you go to the mountain. There was no other ship for you to get in. And now all of a sudden you're here. How did this happen? And it's an amazing thing. With all these verses that talk about their confusion about how he got there. And Jesus makes absolutely no effort to answer them. None. See, he's not really interested in discussing the things that he can do with people that aren't interested in accepting the things that he can do. And he can do much. He didn't satisfy their curiosity. He did, however, question two things and brought two things to their attention. One was their nature. Look at verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. You want to know about miracles, don't you? You want to know how I got from where I was to here, and you can't figure that out. You want to know how I managed to feed 5,000 people. You're, you're interested in miracles, but you're not interested in miracles because those miracles show the power that I have and because they show that I am the Son of God and the Messiah and Savior of the world, you're just looking for something to eat. They followed him not for love. They followed him for loaves. In verse 27 to 29, he points out something else about them. He's already mentioned their nature. Then he mentions their need. Look at verse 27. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Labor not. Labor not. You're laboring for things that are temporary. You're working for things for today. You're trying to get enough to eat today and you're trying to get me to supply it to you. And you're after the temporal. You're after the immediate. Don't labor for those things. Labor for something everlasting. And by the way, I can give it to you. I, the Son of Man, can give you that that is everlasting. Will you stop thinking about those things that are temporal and will you Change your mind to things that are eternal. And he's telling them it cannot be earned. I can give it to you. You're laboring. Stop laboring. Let me give you that that you cannot give and cannot gain on your own. 
He sealed, verse 27, sealed. Talks about the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. The word sealed there means security or permanence. You need to understand today that he's telling you what he's telling them. I am the only way you'll come to the Father because the Father has given me, he has given me this power. The Father gave to Jesus Christ the power to not only buy redemption, but to administer redemption. And he will give eternal life, everlasting life to anyone who will come to him and ask him for it. Don't, don't, don't labor for those things that are right now and right in front of you. Change your mind. Think about things that are eternal and everlasting. And if you will do that, you'll understand. The Father sealed me, Jesus said, to give you that. And I can. And I want to. And they completely ignored what he said. Don't labor. Do not labor for those things that are temporary. And they ignored it. And their very next question is, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? The patience of Jesus Christ amazes me. I would have looked back at that crowd and said, I just said, don't labor. And I'm so glad that my Savior is not like me. Amen. He is patient and he is loving and he draws men to him. Labor not. The human heart longs to labor. Something, something we can do to please God. Every single false religion has one thing in common. It allows man to do something to please God. And there's nothing man can do to please God but come to him and ask him for forgiveness and ask Jesus Christ to be his Savior. That's all man can do. What can we do? How can we work the works of God? How can we labor? Naaman the leper needed help. The prophet of God came to him and said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to this old muddy river here. I want you to dip into it seven times and you'll be fine. And he didn't like that. He wanted to do something else. And he fussed about it and said, aren't there any? There are more beautiful rivers back where I come from. Why do I have to dip in this thing? And man's always looking at salvation and questioning God about salvation. Why do I have to do this instead of that? And the answer to that is that in Jesus Christ, God the Father sealed redemption. And it's in him. And there is no other way. Amen. Naaman finally did the right thing because his, his helpers talked him into it and he was healed. But man's always looking for something. Works. I will punish my body. I will, I will fight to keep the law. I will do something and try to grab God's attention. You already have God's attention. He sent his son to Calvary because you already had his attention. This is the work of God, Jesus said in verse 29, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Oh my, how clear, how clear. What can we do? Give us, what can we do? Give us some work we can do before God. I'll tell you what you can do. You can believe on him who the Father sent. How much clearer can he be? Again, they ignore him. Look at verse 30. They said, therefore, unto him, What sign showest thou then uh, that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. What sign? What did he do yesterday? He fed 15,000 people with a couple of sardines. What sign are you looking for? Matthew 12. In Matthew 12, we read these words. He answered and said unto them, also looking for a sign, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Oh, you're looking for a sign? You're looking for a sign? I'll give you a sign. I'm going to die, and I'm going to go into a grave, and I'm going to come out of that grave three days later, something no man has ever done. 
That will be your sign. You're looking for bread. You're looking for, so you're looking for, for, for fireworks. You're looking for smoke and mirrors. And I'm telling you, I'm the son of God and I've come to die. And when I die, I will come out of that tomb as a testament that I was the son of God and that my blood was accepted for your sin. That's the sign you should be looking for. I don't believe these people. They, they pointed to, they have Jesus Christ in front of them and they're excited about Moses. Hey, back in the wilderness, Moses fed that you had all this neat bread. What are they after? Is there transparency not there for you to see? Lord, just feed us some more bread, would you? Give us a little more bread. You know, give us a sign. Hey, here's an idea. Feed us. And that's what they said. How selfish, how, how silly, how blind to have the bread of life standing in front of them and they're begging for crumbs. What a statement of unbelief. As great as Moses. Jesus gave Moses the power to turn water to blood. Jesus blew on the Red Sea and stacked up the waters so they could avoid Pharaoh's chariots. Jesus was the one that sent manna from heaven. Jesus gave them life out of the rock Moses struck. He was the water. Jesus filled the camp chest deep with quail. Jesus was the power that healed them when they looked upon the brazen serpent on the pole. Moses, what you have in front of you is the son of God. And you're looking for Moses. Look at verse 32. Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. But my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. And the he there is very specific to an individual. Not he. We have ushers. Speak to him, meaning any one of those male ushers. That's not what this is. He is one specific individual. Moses didn't give you that bread. My father gave you that bread. By the way, my father's giving you bread right now. And I am the bread. Verse 34, my goodness, they still don't quite get it. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Give us this bread today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And just keep on feeding us this bread from now on. And I'm telling you something. He says over and over and over again, when you come to me and you eat of me, you'll never hunger again. When you come to me and, 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 and drink of me, you'll never thirst again. They don't get it. Give us the bread today and tomorrow and the next day. And what Jesus gives you will satisfy you today and forever. Verse 35, oh, he finally pulls back any pretense of any kind in verse 35. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. And believe not. Jesus imparts the truth to us. And that truth sustains us spiritually as bread and water sustains us physically. And they still did not believe. How do I know they didn't believe? Verse 41 tells me they didn't believe. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. They still do not believe. Moses is called of God to go back to Egypt and, and, and bring his, God's people out. He says, I don't know what to tell them. There is no name for God. What am I going to tell them? They're going to ask me who sent you and what am I going to say? And God said back to Moses, I am that I am, and he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. This mysterious name for God, I am that I am. And Jesus used it for himself over and over and over again. He amplified and illustrated, I am in his very person. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. And he said it over and over and over again in his ministry. 
You, you don't know who you're talking to, but I'll tell you who you're talking to. You're talking to I am. And I can do everything that I tell you I can do. He said that's to them very hurtfully, I think. Verse 36, but I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. Look at chapter 5 and verse 40. It should be right across the page there. Jesus is preaching and he, he's talking to the Jews and he's telling them, look, I know you search the scriptures, but I don't think you know what you're looking for. He says, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, verse 39, and they are they which testify of me. This book only has one message, and it's Jesus. And ye will not come to me, verse 40, that ye might have life. Here I am. You're looking for bread for Moses. For Moses, I am the bread. And my father sent that bread to Moses. And my father has sent me to you. And I am the bread that's come down from the father. And I am the bread of life. But you will not come to me. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Isaiah chapter 1, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Revelation 22, and the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is a thirst say, come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. And the word of God echoes like a bell. Come. 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 But you will not come to me that I might give you life. God will never invite you to come to him and make it impossible for you to reach him. I want you to look at verse 37 of chapter 6. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. I will in no wise cast out. Here's an example where the English doesn't allow us to see the dynamic of the Greek. In the Greek, I will not no, I will not cast you out. I will not. No, I will not. It's God giving you his promise. Come to me. You will not come to me that I might give you life. He says, all that come to me, I will not. No, I will not cast out. Jesus came to accomplish the Father's eternal purpose on earth in regard to you and in regard to me. John chapter 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Promises, not suggestions. Promises. He that comes to me, we is passed from death into life. He is no longer under condemnation. What did they ask him? What did they ask him? What is it that we can do? What are the works of God that we might be able to do? Tell us what we can do, Jesus. And his answer is an answer I hope that your heart will contemplate this morning. This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. Do you know him? Do you see the power and do you hear the preaching of the Son of God? Do you understand what he wants to do for you and to you? Do you understand he can do everything that he has promised he can do? but you will not come to me that you might have life.
The invitation is clear. You, you may be watching by way of rejoice, and you're sitting there in a chair on a couch, and you've never trusted Christ. Would you come to him that he may give you life? Trust him right there. Right now, receive him. Tell him you need him as Savior. Reach out and grab him and pull him into your boat this morning. I receive you as my Savior. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord, coming to you from the Campus Church at Pensacola Christian College. Your financial help is vital in keeping the Rejoice telecast on the air. With your tax-deductible gift, this viewer-supported ministry can continue to reach the world with the good news. Please let us know how Rejoice has been a blessing to you. Rejoice TV messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus, this is Rejoice in the Lord.